Hey, hey, friends. It is time for day one of our matcha lunch and learn. So I just want you to know ahead of time that I am pre-recording these videos for you this week uh, because we leave tomorrow for Paris. Uh, today's Monday and we leave tomorrow, Tuesday for Paris. Um, and so I'm really, really excited to get to stay in touch with you guys. I just wanted to, to leave some content here for you while we're gone. I'll still have my phone and I'll still be commenting. So please stay in touch. And again, as I said um, on our, our Bruce Day Tuesday last week, if you're not friends, personal friends with me on Facebook, I would love for you to friend me and start following. I'm going to be posting. I'm probably going to be annoying in my stories about all of my pictures from our Paris trip, but I'd love for you to follow along on our little anniversary journey. So um, this is day one of our matcha lunch and learn. We're gonna talk today about the history of matcha, what matcha is, kind of how it got started. But I've been drawing a lot of my inspiration from this gorgeous book that I ordered on Amazon. Um, I've made a little graphic to kind of walk through the big timeline pieces of the history of matcha. And so we're just gonna talk today. And each day I'm gonna teach you a little something and we're gonna make a matcha drink. And so, different ways matcha can be consumed in so many different ways i'm gonna make five different matcha drinks for you this week and it's barely gonna scratch the surface of what we can do with matcha so it's pretty amazing um i pulled out a bag this morning of our mocha matcha um this is not one of our sweetened flavors it's just a regular matcha that we have and i'm gonna make our matcha drink together with you with using mocha matcha today so just a little bit of history and i do have some notes so bear with me as i look down a little bit um, matcha started out in China during the Tang Dynasty, and now we attribute matcha to Japan, but it traveled actually, it started in, in China. So they had known the benefits of green tea, and they were trying to figure out ways that they could package and transport the tea in a more efficient manner. So they would um, steam and dry the leaves into like cakes of tea so that it could be, um, purchased easier, it could be transported and exported. And at one point, one of the tea um, gurus, I guess, um, one of maybe he was a Zen Buddhist, if I'm looking at my notes correctly, started kind of um, breaking those tea cakes apart and like rubbing them into powder and then whisking it into water. So it's kind of a cross between the way that we um, the, the way that we steep tea and the way that we drink matcha. So matcha is not steeped, it's actually stirred into the water and it doesn't dissolve, but you can suspend it. So like it's, you wanna get it all stirred up really good so all of the particles are suspended in the water or whatever liquid you're using. But they were rubbing these tea cakes and eventually it became that powder kind of, but it wasn't the type of matcha that we know today. It was more of a brown color. Um, and so that actually became really popular in Japan. And at that time, the tea that they were, that they were using in these tea cakes was a little bit different. Um, but the, the Zen Buddhist monks were really some of the first uh, people to recognize these benefits that they were getting when they were drinking matcha. And so they said that it enabled them to be much more centered and focused and have this kind of sustained energy that carried them through the day. They were able to meditate. Um, and they really thought it was really special. And they actually started calling this matcha the ceremonial tea of the temple high priests. So what I'm gonna make with you today, we're gonna keep talking about the history. I just have a plain bowl and I have a traditional matcha whisk. Uh, this is really a fun way to like go back to the Japanese tea ceremony. Um, although that's like a four hour process that you have to be certified in it's like a super secret society um to be to be a, a tea master like that for the for the tea ceremony but i bought a set um, quite a while ago on amazon that just has some measuring tools for how you would measure out and use uh your matcha like you would just measure it in this little kind of the crook of the neck there and then tap it i mean there's i can't pretend to know the japanese tea ceremony but that this is one of the tools that is from that. And people still do create their matcha this way. Um, it's, it's a very ritual way, I don't know, ritualistic way to kind of think about that matcha. I'm actually gonna use my, my Sipology matcha teaspoon. This is half a teaspoon is a serving. And I'm just gonna put that right in our bowl. So you can just see the powder right there inside the bowl. Um, 
And then I am gonna use our traditional matcha whisk on this today. So I've got some hot water that's ready to go. And I'm just gonna add about a quarter of a cup, maybe half a cup to our bowl. And remember our goal is to suspend all of the powder, all of the molecules in that powder in the liquid. And so we take the whisk and we just start making little M's or W's. And I've got some on the edge there. Let me get something off. So I'm just gonna start whisking. I'm gonna set this down so I don't spill it all over myself. But while I'm whisking on that, let's talk about a little bit more of the history. So matcha was extremely precious um, and they didn't, they didn't make it in very high quantities. It was, it was not exported. It was, it was kind of a, a precious commodity. It was kind of rarefied. But there was one big change in the production of matcha that really made it uh, kind of take on the bright green color that we see today. And that is that they discovered, it's called the Uji method, U-J-I. It's, it's from the region where this was discovered and developed. Up until this point, the tea was grown fully in the sun the whole time that it was in, in the ground until it was harvested. But they decided that they would cover the tea plants with a shade for the last four or five weeks of its growing period. And so harvest, uh, this would have been in like April or May. And then after it had been covered and shaded for about four weeks or so, then it's harvested. So here's what that does. And guys, just be aware, this is the biology professor in me like geeking out on the science because it's so cool. Um, when a plant feels like it's in trouble, especially like if you shade it all of a sudden and it thinks it can't find light, it's gonna change the chemistry of that plant. So it's actually gonna start creating different chemicals to help it create its own food source. We know if plants go through photosynthesis and so when a plant goes through a shaded period like that, it's kind of fighting for its life. Like it's creating its own food source and it creates this chemical called L-theanine, which is an amino acid that we all have, but it, it like goes into ultra crazy production of this L-theanine. Can you see how I'm getting some bubbles now on the surface? This is gonna take me a little while. This is why I use an electric frother now, but this is such a beautiful process. So that, shading of the plants really caused the greenness to come out because you have more chloroplasts that are going through photosynthesis and creating that L-theanine. Um, but it's also uh, changing the nutrient value in those plant, in those tea leaves. And so when it's harvested, it's this ultra bright green color and it's got these really high antioxidant levels uh, because the plant was basically trying to fend for itself and create its own, its own food because it didn't have as much light. So that's a little bit of the science behind it. But when they discovered this Uji method, that's when they were able to start really kind of kicking the production into high gear. And there was a famous, I have it on the timeline. I'll share that graphic later. I think his name is Sohan Nagatani. He really wanted matcha to come to the, to the everyday man. He wanted it to come to all of the people and not just be uh, you know, for the highest of the, of the shogun or of the warriors. He wanted everyone to be able to discover that. And so this, there was a difference between that ceremonial grade of matcha and more of a culinary grade of matcha that was developed at this time. And so then they could really bring that matcha into, uh, you know, exporting it into other countries and bringing it into everyone's life. But it's that ceremonial grade that's the highest quality of the, of the matcha plants. Um, and so I just thought that was a really interesting history. You can tell we're getting some good bubbles on, a, uh, you can't really see all of them, but if, unless I spill this on you. I'm having to work pretty hard with that whisk to get it to bubble. Let me show you something. This is my cheater's method. This is just an electric frother that I got on Amazon. And I'm just gonna froth really quickly. Let me just do a couple. Oh, it's gonna spill because it's a bowl instead of a cup. But just with a couple of little like whips right here. Can you see the difference in the bubbles now? See how we're getting a lot more foam on the top there? You really wanna get it suspended really well in the water. And so then you would just drink in the, in the Japanese tea ceremony, which we're not doing. I'm just, I'm just trying to give you an example. You would just drink the matcha. Mm. This is the unsweetened flavor. This was mocha that we made. And it's hot and it's just, you, you have the earthiness. It's got a lot of that umami flavor, um, which is that fifth kind of taste sense, taste bud on your tongue. 
but the mocha really adds a nice touch to that. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the history of matcha today, how it got started. And of course now we're seeing it all over. I mean, in 2010, I think Starbucks brought the matcha latte to the United States. Um, and it's really starting to gain popularity here. So our matcha is definitely super high quality. Our founder, Tanya, and her husband, Hadam. Hadam is the scientist, and he really sources this out from the very best places. It's the highest quality matcha, and our flavoring is all natural. Um, of course, even the sweet flavors. This one you can see is five calories. Even the sweetened flavor is five calories, but all this has in it is green tea and natural flavor. That's all that it's gonna have in it, and by natural flavor, we mean things, natural parts of the plant, like essential oils um, and, and things that are gonna be, they're not, uh, artificial in any way. So I totally am a believer. I drink my matcha every single day. Um, and I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about the history. Tomorrow on our Lunch and Learn together, we're going to do a quick little myth busters about matcha. So I've got some facts that I want to talk about and some, some uh, untruths, some myths that you may have seen about matcha. So we're going to be myth busters tomorrow. And I'm going to be, let me look at my list. I'm going to be make, making a cold matcha latte for you tomorrow. So I hope you come back during your lunch break tomorrow or whenever you're catching these videos. I hope these are fun for you to get to learn a little bit about matcha. So have a great day, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow.